Hi. Oh, hi. Can you hear and see me okay? That's perfectly. Hi, Kara. Hi, Christian. Hello. 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 How are you doing? Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We are all excited to hear from you. We have people from all over the world. Please write to us where you're coming from. Yeah, hello from India, Armenia, Los Angeles. Welcome everyone to the third session of Clo Academic Month 2023. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming. Yes, write on the chat or answer to the poll. Where are you based right now? We're just starting our third session. The academic month is happening every Wednesday. Uh, we started two weeks ago in October 18, and it will go until November 15, every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. So you just have to join us to hear from many universities how they have implemented CLO to their curriculum, and also about the special projects that they are developing, like the one we're going to hear now, um, which is Shape Not Size. Before I tell you more about the academic month, let me first introduce myself. My name is Fernanda. Um, I'm the academic lead at CLO Europe. Um, I joined CLO in 2021 as a 3D designer. My background is in fashion design, but today my work is to support schools when implementing CLO. So from licenses to training, anything that is needed. So if you'd like to um, start teaching CLO at your school, let us know. You can drop us a message. If you need help with implementation as well, it will be a pleasure to support you. So you can see on the screen, there is a contact us page. You can just drop us a message and we'll get back to you very soon. Today with me, we have Arts University Bournemouth. Um, I will introduce you to them very soon uh, and to what we've been talking today. Uh, first of all, I wanted to talk to you about what is the purpose of the academic month. So our idea is to give the stage to schools um, so they can share with us how they've implemented CLO. We have so many great stories and we think that this needs to be shared so we can learn with one another and also inspire the ones who are still in the implementation process. This is the third edition. Uh, we started in 2021. So if you are curious about it, if you want to know more, from other schools, how they've implemented CLO, you can check our YouTube um, page. We have a playlist, uh, it's there on the, on the screen as well. It will take you to all the past editions that we have done. It's very inspiring. I highly recommend you checking this out. So we started in October 18 with Instituto Secoli. Uh, we talked about pattern making. Uh, if you don't know, Instituto Secoli is well known for their um, pattern making classes, and they shared with us how they've implemented CLO to these classes. We know how important this topic is for the fashion industry and for the academia. So it will be, it was recorded, it will be on our playlist um, very soon. We had also last week Erasmus Plus funding, three schools, design school, coding, William de Koning Academy and University of Ljubljana telling us how they've applied for Erasmus Plus funding um, with a 3D fashion education program and how they successfully got the funding. So it was like a talk through their application process. We know also so many people are willing to um, apply. So they shared with us how they managed to do it. Today it's shape not size with Arts University Bournemouth. They will also share how they've implemented CLO to their fashion curriculum. Um, and Professor Penelope will be sharing with us her research about how um, bespoke avatars can improve inclusivity, fit, and sustainability. I can't wait to hear all about it very soon. Next week, an invitation for you to join us next week, 5.30, the same time, Central Europe time. You can register here. Um, we will hear from the German International University from Cairo, how they've implemented CLO from scratch. They will also share how they run interdisciplinary projects to motivate students and foster 3D at the, at the school. Then last 
the closing the academic month, we will have Hanover University showing how they digitized a garment from the 16th century. So the garment that you're seeing now on the screen, uh, it's a 3D of um, a clothing from a, a duke from the 16th century, and they will take us over how they digitized um, the, the patterns and how they rebuilt the, the, the duke's outfit. So you see, we have many different um, types of presentations. Um, join us, because then you have the opportunity to ask questions to the speakers. We will have a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to write on the chat your questions. And at the end, we will um, ask our speakers. Uh, last invitation, if you want to present next year on the academic months of 2024, let us know. It will be a pleasure to have, um, have you here. Just drop us a message and tell that you'd like to participate and share how you've been implementing CLO. Or maybe if you have a special project, we can also share it. So now um, I'd like to introduce you. To our speakers, we have Pe um, Penelope Norman. She's the course leader of MA Digital Fashion Innovation at Arts University Bournemouth. We have Christian Ostevic. Um, he's an alumni from AUB, and today he's a visiting tut tutor at the school. And also Kyra Gibson, alumni as well from AUB, and she today is a 3D technologist. So thank you so much. Um, for accepting our invitation to, to share um, your research and how AUB is implementing CLO. Um, Penelope, what about uh, introducing yourself and, and sharing with us um, your work? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, and thank you for all your ongoing support with us um, using and implementing CLO, which we've been doing for quite a while now. Um, I am just going to share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see some of our work. Bear with me one moment. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as Fernanda said, my name's Penny and I run the MA in Digital Fashion Innovation here at AUB. Um, I'm really lucky in my role at AUB as well that I get um, time with our innovation studio to go out into industry and consult on the implementation of 3D creation and production methodologies um, with different brands. Um, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more about me and what I do when I come on to kind of talking about uh, my research in more depth. But to start with, I want to introduce you to both the fabulous Kyra and Christian as well. So I don't know, Christian, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone. My name is uh, Christian. Uh, I am originally from Norway. I've been in the UK for 10 years. Moved to Bournemouth to uh, study fashion uh, at the Art University of Bournemouth. Um, did menswear in the beginning. I've always been really interested in uh, combining uh, digital technology and fashion. Uh, and it was a perfect university for me to go to to uh, do that and implement that. Um, and then later on, uh, I started working for them as a, a technician demonstrator in the beginning, implementing CLO into their curriculum and then um, eventually doing my uh, master's in uh, digital fashion innovation. Uh, now, today, I am working as a digital fashion freelancer as well as working as a visiting tutor for um, the university. Thank you, Christian and Kyra. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kyra. I also um, studied fashion at AUB um, and I kind of picked up my love of digital fashion um, from the course and also through being through COVID, uh, kind of getting thrown in at the deep end um, with all the closures and things. Um, and I've not really stopped since then and pursuing digital fashion. Uh, after finishing my degree, I also ended up back at um, AUB uh, working in the innovation studio for a while, which I'm sure Penny will pick up on later um, and working on innovation projects um, with digital fashion. Um, so that's where I've kind of picked up all of my VR and uh, other showroom skills that you'll see later on. Um, and I now work as a 3D technologist. Great, thank you, Kyra. So 
Um, just to sort of start and give you an overview on what it is we do, um, we pride ourselves here at the university for implementing digital fashion innovation um, right from the moment the students join us. Um, the fashion landscape is changing at exponential rates and I think it's imperative that fashion curriculum acknowledges and embraces these changes to ensure graduates are equipped to enter the, enter the industry. Um, digital fashion is playing a major role in the progression of design and supply chains, but also in how fashion is consumed and um, experienced. So we find it really important to make sure that our students are going out there ready for the industry that is now emerging. They're studying for jobs that don't necessarily exist yet. Um, just to sort of give a quick overview um, of how we implemented CLO to start with, um, this sort of explains again, and it's, it's something we use when we're talking to industry and talking to the students. Obviously, if you're physically sampling and fitting garments, uh, whether you be a student or in industry, um, you are resampling and refitting a lot. You're going backwards and forwards with fit models. Students, you're using lots of fabric when you are creating your samples. Um, and then your grading system can be without fitting and you produce and you end up with a physical garment. What we want our students on the BA to do here is run through a rigorous digital sampling and fit process. So they'll still physically produce a sample. They don't have to, if they don't want to, they can completely choose digital fashion as their pathway. Um, and some students have done that in the past with alternative projects and not produced anything. But what we pride ourselves on is the fact that the, um, the way we use digital fashion, the way we use CLO is not just for digital fashion artwork, it is actually to support um, in real life garments. Um, so students will use avatars um, in CLO 3D to design, to fit, to sample, then they'll usually produce a final sample um, and then they'll have two products at the end of it. They'll have a physical garment and a digital garment. So they're getting twice as much um, for something that is wasting a lot less. So we find that as a really important um, kind of element to the BA. So moving on from that, we also have our MA in digital fashion innovation. So we were, um, we were one of the first universities to um, integrate a full digital fashion innovation um, master's course. Um, and a lot of that is based around well, it's masters, it's research. Um, and we encourage our students to explore and discover through both focused and critical approaches to reflective inquiry and future design practice. Um, the course encourages and supports designers, young and old, of all different um, ages to explore and work with advanced digital technologies to interrogate and to question current fashion practice and challenge the idea of around how a product is, is produced, is released onto the market. Um, we all know that's something really important, and I'll come on and talk a little bit more about that shortly. So the philosophy of the course, this is a lovely image here. This is from one of our BA students, Zach Fornelius. Um, it's, it's still one of the images which I really enjoy sharing um, because I think kind of the elements of the levels of rendering that he got to using Play 3D um, and then the realization of the garment. I think it's kind of, you know, what we want to see when we're using digital, if we're using digital for real life production, is that we want to see that the garments that we are working with digitally are true to life when we create them uh, physically. And I think this is a great example of this. Um, Part of the philosophy of the course and part of my personal philosophy as well is obviously fashion is recognized as one of the most damaging industries on the planet. Um, and therefore it's critical um, that designers acknowledge and attempt to address um, these issues. Um, and we feel that by harnessing digital fashion, digital fashion isn't the answer to all things sustainable. You know, nothing sustainable. There's still a carbon footprint from using a computer and rendering a product. But we feel that by systematically questioning existing ideals and design methods and bringing in digital fashion solutions, we can become a better industry. And that's something that we ask students to look at on the MA course as well here. Um, students can 
produce any range of uh, projects when they come and do the MA, um, whether that be fully digital, digital art, or whether they're looking at kind of IRL kind of solutions. Um, the other great thing about our university is that we have our innovation studio. Um, so it operates as a lab for creative technologies and it's a place for startup and regional enterprise. Um, and it's a great hub for industry, industry engagement as well. So within that, we have 3D printing, we have VR and all of these lovely other technologies that we can link in with our close 3D um, work that we do here. Um, so students, the, the image on the far right there, one of our students on the MA was big into gaming um, and actually was creating outfits that both the avatar could wear in the gaming world, but then could also be 3D printed as, um, as kind of sculptures to have around the house and accessories, which is super exciting. Um, so just a little bit kind of about what, you know, what, what I feel and what we feel at Arts University Bournemouth is really important. Um, is to give students the skills that they need to bridge the gap between the digital and the physical. So students should be offered the opportunity to graduate with an understanding of the different realities shaping the industry. Extended reality is revolutionising how fashion is consumed and experienced both digitally and in real life. And the AUB Fashion Innovation Curriculum is designed to offer students the opportunity to work between these different realities while constantly questioning the economical, ethical and ecological impact of their work. So it's something where students can come and they can use Clo 3D in collaboration with augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, mixed reality. Um, so it's something we really pride on. And the work that you see in the background there is uh, work by Alan Kelly, who is who has done the MA with us and I think Fernando is organising something fabulous with him to showcase some of his work in the near future. Um, so again, another element of things that we look at on uh, AUB is demand driven and bespoke experiences. This is um, a website created by Michael Johnson, who is one of our MA students, um, looking at producing on demand, um, you know, but also a bespoke element. We have bespoke opportunities in most areas of our life nowadays and we want it in our fashion experiences as well so again it's something that it's really important that students consider um, so having a mixed reality and a bespoke offering is again something that's super important so the idea here was that the garments could be customized and then they would be made with um, made on demand um, augmented reality and Web3, again, another area that where Clo is supporting us to stay ahead of the game um, in our curriculum. This is some work by Alex Petru. Um, and again, kind of just, you know, pushing the boundaries. Um, obviously, he was looking more into kind of Web3 and blockchain. Um, and, you know, that augmented reality, virtual try on, virtual fit. So again, something that we'd love to love to get involved with here and then just finally to sort of round up everything that we we kind of offer and use clo 3d for here is um virtual reality so vr showrooms is something that we've been integrating into our curriculum um with our students from their second year on the ba when we're doing live projects um a lot of brands now want to partner with us for live projects because obviously we we can offer them the opportunity for sort of risk-free testing. Um, lots of people like a bit of risk-free testing and, you know, it's great for our students because then they get that amazing collaboration with industry and they're able to, you know, try all of this. Um, again, this is from Ruth Tavernaski's um, BA collection. So she actually created all of these garments in real life um, as well as um, creating a virtual world for them to exist. So a little bit of background on kind of what we do here and what we feel we do very well here with the support of CLO. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about my research. So as academics working um, in universities, we, uh, we, we love to research and we love to find the time to research. Um, and so something that I've been looking at is the sizing systems, standardizing of sizing, what's working, what's not working, how can we integrate digital to support with that. So a little bit about me um, and kind of some of the brands I've either collaborated through with um, 
live projects or in the past. Um, I worked for a brand called Anna Schultz for a long time, celebrating um, shape, not size, plus size bodies, curves. Um, that was something that was really important to me. And then working at Turnbull and Asa as well, where I was able to kind of look more detailed into bespoke um, digital patterns for bespoke. But it kind of brought me to a place where I was getting to a stage within the industry where I, I wanted to implement changes. Um, I wanted my industry to be more sustainable and inclusive. I wanted to adopt better practice with the digital. Um, but as many of you who work in the industry know, there's not always that time for that R&D and that kind of, you know, testing, trying new things, which is what brought me to the Arts University Bournemouth. Um, and it's one of the lovely things about being an academic in this space is that you do get the opportunity to test and then you get platforms like this where I can talk to all of you about kind of implementing new ways of working. So Shape Not Size, uh, the project addresses issues around fitting and how problems highlighted in traditional approaches to sizing can be addressed through the implementation of virtual fitting and prototyping. More specifically, this research focuses on the use of digital avatars and body scanning to improve the fit process and challenge and enhance the existing sizing system implemented through most companies and brands. Um, this research was all conducted in consultation, in consultation with several brands um, that are at the forefront of digital fashion innovation from different market sectors. So, Ethos. Uh, my industry career was based around inclusion of diverse body shape and fashion, and it's hugely important to me that fashion is inclusive. No matter what your size or shape, an individual should have access to well-fitting garments that have a positive effect on mental health and confidence. It's imperative that production and design are sustainable. Fashion is one of the worst industries for its wasteful and damaging practices, and we're not going to be able to abolish fast fashion. That's that's not going to happen, especially in the current climate um, and with the kind of attention span of us, um, our generations, younger generations, we want everything quickly. But what we can do is we can help the industry adopt better working methodologies to improve the processes that they are using to create fast fashion. Um, and I do believe that by adopting digital methodologies alongside the traditional methods, brands can make an impact in the industry um, on the environment in a positive way. So just to discuss quickly some of the engagement and contributors in this project, um, industry consultants, I worked with Sarah Mole, who was representing a high street brand, Tammy Bruce and Charlotte Dreadwell, who were um, representing a supermarket brand, Ian Archer as a creative director and educational consultant, and Caitlin Martin and Lucy Goodyear for a luxury heritage UK British brand. Um, and then my collaboration with my colleagues, um, it's Kyra, who's on the call with us today, who's going to be talking about the virtual reality showrooms that we created, um, Jordan Cutler, who supported with the VR experience as well, and then of course Christian, who was full support of all aspects Clo 3D. Um, so, the, when we're carrying out research, there's always a problem, and we're trying to fix a problem. So the motivation for the work was to use digital fashion innovation technologies to address two overarching themes, inclusivity of diverse body shapes in fashion and the need to adopt a more sustainable approach to the, pop, to the to production and sampling practices. Um, you know, we have an ever-growing mass production model fueling mass consumerism um, and garments and clothing have become a throwaway commodity. Um, so we need to work out what we're going to do with sorting out the problem of amassing tons of dead stock, etc. Um, and I truly believe that programs like Close 3D can support us to be better practitioners. So qualitative assumptions, dead stock is accumulating at alarming rates. Um, we, we should all be aware of that. Producing digital garments will reduce oversaturation. If we're not producing sample upon sample in real fabrics, we are going to lessen dead stock. Um, actioning change in the sampling process, not just talking about it, actioning it can positively impact the sustainability of a garment. Um, and I believe there's a place for a virtual avatar library addressing body diversity um, within brands' product life cycles to reduce oversampling. So, a sustainable approach, statement of a problem. I apologize, this image is a little blurry. 
Um, greenwashing and dead stop. Why five pound fashion is destined for landfill. We know, we should know, everybody should know. If you don't know, you do know now. If you are paying a very small price for a garment, it will not have been produced ethically or with any form of sustainability in mind. It is just not possible. And I think it's something to be really aware of. Um, the phrase climate change sounds really rather passive and gentle when what, what I think we're talking about is a catastrophe for humanity, okay? And I know that's quite a big statement, Fernanda. I'm sure you'll love it that I'm going to say cloak and stop us in our kind of approach for catastrophe for humanity. But 80% of environmental impacts can be influenced at the design stage. So if we are using better technology and we are using better practices at the design stage, we can really start to undo some of the damage that we've been doing. Um, we have a responsibility as designers and consumers of fashion to adopt greener practices um, and not to support greenwashing. So, the other statement of the problem is thinking about inclusivity and diversity of body shapes. Um, from an industry perspective, speaking to Sarah Mole from the high street, um, here's a couple of quotes. So I, sp I spoke to a lot of people throughout this research and I've just pulled out a few quotes here that kind of support the other element of the, of the problem. So she said, for a product development team and particularly for a pattern cutter, seeing each subsequent sample round on the same design of the same fit model is crucial. If you're tweaking the fit of a garment and making changes to the pattern, it's impossible to tell if your changes were correct when you see the next sample on a completely new person. And that's one of the issues we've, we've faced. We haven't necessarily got the same fit models coming in every time because they're not available. We fluctuate. So again, she's gone and say, I've struggled in the past to book older fit models who might be more representative of the customer we're aiming for and whose body shape might vary somewhat for someone of the same dress size um, who's in their 20s or 30s. If we can start to see a range of avatars freely available who represent a wide range of ages and ethnicities, I think we'll learn a lot about the way we should be grading patterns. Maybe in futures, brands will even change what sizes they want to offer in store. I think that's a really interesting point. I think kind of when we think about the sizing system, we think about size 12, size 14, size... But really, what does that mean? What does that mean to the consumer? What does that mean to the person? What does it mean in terms of measurements? Because I have to say, as I will be showing you later on, I've body scanned a lot of people and I've got what the ticket says they should be and the, the measurements aren't matching up with how they identify. So there are things that we need to be working on and things that we need to change. And then you've got, again, the consumer perspective. What about us? What about the consumers as well? What do the public know and understand about the process of garment production um, and how this impact impacts on the fit you know if i step away from the world that i'm in um at all market levels it's clear that although there's little understanding of the production process um and the negative impact it maybe has on the garment one thing is really really clear consumers are not happy um poor poorly fitting garments and the lack of body inclusivity in the creation of garments um and you're seeing it being publicly scrutinized on TikTok all the time. I have a few examples here. This quote, I think, and this one always start. I'm so fast in Primark, in general too, but especially in Primark. You know, people are actually taking to the media, say, look, this isn't making me feel good. The way that you're sizing your garments isn't making me feel good. We can go on TikTok all the time. We can see people in news articles. They go and buy a pair of size 12 trousers even from the same store, and they don't fit them. Again, all of these are the same size trousers. Somebody's put that on TikTok there. Um, they're clearly not the same size. So I think what we can kind of gather from the things that I've really tried to quickly go through is the fact that um, as a brand, if you sample and you have a bad fit, you're going to cancel your garment or it's going to end up as dead stock. Um, if it's a good fit, you're going to produce it. Great. That's nice and easy. As a consumer, if you purchase it and it's a bad fit, you're going to return it again, dead stop. If you purchase it and it's a good fit, you're going to keep it, keep and produce. It's a cycle that we like. It's something we want to try and kind of work on. So again, some takeaways, we, we can understand dead stops accumulating, action change needs to happen. Producing digital garments will reduce oversaturation of product and consumers want clothes that fit. So 
it would be dangerous for the industry to stand still. And so I've spoken to a number of people in the industry. Again, so Charlotte Treadwell, who I interviewed in 2022, representing a supermarket digital pattern and production manager. Although there is room for improvement with the accuracy of digital fitting technology, I definitely see the benefits of digital fitting. I can fit the product instantly after creating the pattern, allowing me to review and fit portions of the garment of a, on a body form. We can see a lot more variety in our models using a digital platform than we can feasibly see in real life. Again, coming back to this, brand and consumer. If you provide a good fit as a brand, you're going to make sales, you're going to have repeat customers, you're going to make a profit. As a consumer, you find a brand that fits you well, you make the purchase, you repeat the purchase. Brand loyalty and profit, they go great hand in hand. Good fitting garments lead to profit and brand loyalty. Bad fit, doesn't sell, doesn't buy, ends up as dead stock. So, brings me on, just to kind of give you an overview of why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, to my prototype avatar library. So, my main focus was to get real women into a body scanner and to look at their body shapes. Not their sizes, their shapes. I do have their data, I do have their sizes, but what I was interested in was their shapes. I was interested in how they perceived themselves, how they identified as a UK high street size 12. So I put out a call for women saying, do you identify and do you buy a UK high street size 12? If so, would you like to be part of my project? Um, and that's basically where it all started. Just for due diligence, everybody scanned a body consent form and gave me the permission to use their um, biometric data. For GDPR, this is really important. So anybody going into any of this, um, thinking about kind of body scanning or anything that includes holding data, it's really important to make sure that you follow due diligence and ethical procedures. Um, so. My test scan and my conversion. Here we go, we're gonna get onto using some clone now, <laughs> the bit you've probably been waiting for. So what I was doing is I was using the size stream uh, body scanner to scan the women, and then I was bringing them into Clothe 3D to create their avatars so I could fit the garments and see, see how the avatars worked. Um, to start with, it was quite a lengthy process. So I would have to start by selecting a stock avatar and then I would need to change the stance of my body scanned data um, to change the stance of the stock avatar to the body scan data. Um, I'd then have to go in after manipulating the stance um, and then use the biometric data to manipulate the avatar to the measurements of the body scan. This was quite a time consuming process at the time. Um, and it was, I found that it was important to start with the measurements from the top down, because as soon as you move one measurement, something else moved. And in fact, the one of the biggest issues I had was the rise and shape of the avatar's bottom. The only available option um, with the hip is the hips on the apex. And when increasing her bottom, it also added millimeters to her hips and tummy. So that, that was kind of causing a few issues. Um, so, I was able to do that, but it wasn't a quick process. Um, and I was thinking about how can I create this more accurately? Luckily, the lovely people at Clo brought out the auto convert um, with their update. So this obviously made a massive difference in the way I was able to kind of use my data. Um, so yeah, I went from having to do all of that work to being able to press one little button um, which was really great. So you open the file you wish to convert from the raw data um, and then you can, that, you know, it's sufficient for what we need at this stage of the project. All I had to do was select the gender, skin type, check rigging only, select where to save the file and convert. And then I've got a, I'm sure some of you have probably used this in the past, but then we've got a lovely little video here of the conversion process. Um, I won't go all the way through this because you can have a play with it yourself and see, but it gives you a lovely avatar at the end of it, which is great. There's a few things I learned along the way. Um, a pre-scanning questionnaire um, was important to do to start with. Um, I'd like to use a wider range of ages. Um, the words that participants used to describe themselves became quite important in the research. 
Um, and I would say that the visuals created um, the women, they did, they did identify with those. So there was a few things that I did wrong along the way as well. Um, when you're body scanning, make sure your participant has their hair up. As you can see there, her hair was down. That was no good at all. Also, uh, scanning. The scanner that we use has handles. So you hold on to the handles. Um, if you don't then let go of the handles and point your fingers down, the auto convert will foreshorten your arms to the point of the fist that you've made from holding the handles. So you will end up getting shorter hands. So there was a lot of things to consider that when we went through. Um, so then I had my participants. So I chose seven participants in the end, named them after the day of the week, just because it seemed something appropriate to do with seven participants. Um, I got them to describe themselves as well. I thought that was really interesting because that sort of data can be shared with brands what people actually think. So they all say they're a size 12, but the words they use to describe themselves are all really dis different. Tall, average height, short, curvy, athletic, broad. And we're expecting one size to, to fit all of these women. Um, so again, that was, uh, I used myself, I obviously had to use myself to do this. You have to lead by example if you're asking people to kind of join you in something. Um, and two of my lovely students who took part in the project as well that were happy for me to share their details. So then I had my body scan data and I used Clo3D to auto convert them. Um, and the next thing was to get them dressed. So again, using Clo3D and basic blocks, I started to dress them. Now you can see straight away, I've dressed the one on the left. I've moved that garment in Clo3D over to the one on the right. It's not going to work. You can see already that we've got issues with the fitting. Clothes great for the fact that I can use the fit maps. I was able to use the pressure map. So I was really able to start analyzing the data on all these women who would be picking up the same garment in a shop if they were going to a store. So again, looking at the lengths, you know, if you've got one fit model in a room, you're not, you can't see all of this data. This is what's so great about doing this with Clothe 3D. You're not going to see all of this data. I'm not going to spend ages with all of it on the screen. Um, but you can see the pressure maps, the fit maps, um, button strain. Anybody that's ever worn a shirt probably has male or female. We still have that pressure point across the chest. So again, looking at how the button strain is going to be on different shapes and different sizes. Lengths, really important as well. Um, I was lucky enough to work with um, a supermarket brand that provided me a jumpsuit that they had put into production. It had been through their fitting process. And then I was able to take that through my fitting process as well. So they provided me with the patterns and all of their graded measurements, which I'm not sure I'm actually supposed to share, but there we go, I'll go past that quickly. Um, and then I put the um, garment onto the mannequin in black, it didn't look very good because I couldn't really see what I was doing. So obviously changed everything around, sewed it together on Clo. And then I was able to start looking at kind of making sure the elastic was the right tightness and starting to look at the fit of the garment. Um, jumpsuits are always a really good one if you're working with fit because they're the hardest things to fit because you have to fit every part of them to every part of the body. Um, again, great with, with Clo to be able to kind of pull different pieces off the body, have a look around see how the garment is fitting in different areas. Again, tweaking the rigging a little bit just to make sure um, the avatars are stood up nice and straight. Um, and then I think this is one of my favorite images, kind of taking the jumpsuit uh, on the image on the right off of the tall model and putting it on the short model. Um, I think that pretty much sums up in one image there how Standard sizing is not going to be the fit for the issues we have around making sure that we're inclusive in our fit. Um, so again, some images there of the final garment, I think kind of sometimes taking the bodies away can really highlight kind of the, the fit, the pressure points. So all of this data is available for us to analyze if we're using Clo3D. Um, and then using Clo3D in line with the body scanner Look at, all that, look at all that lovely data. If you get excited about data um, and measurements, as I do, this is very, very exciting. And Clo3D can communicate with all of this data when you're body scanning, which is great. So each of the models had their biometric data, their scan, and then the final model. 
Just to highlight as well um, on the data, I won't go into too much detail with it because it gets a little bit technical, but just for example, looking at kind of some of the UK sizing charts, um, we can see the measurements here, MS, River Island, Lipsy, um, the averages. So the average bust, 36.5. Well, we can see Mondays, 39.5, Tuesdays, 38, Wednesdays, 40, 40.3, 30. So in fact, all of their busts were bigger than the industry average is saying they should be at their size. And in fact, that was the pretty much all of the measurements actually came out bigger than what the industry is saying the average for that size is. So I haven't got the answers to everything, but what I wanted to do with this project was highlight a way that we could maybe start working in a different way with it. There are some limitations. I found it very difficult when I got up to the larger sizes. So I worked with plus size brand Anna Schultz, who sent me size 18 and size 22 mannequins. Clothes, clothes fine, clothes size 18 stock mannequin fitted the size 18 model really well. But then on the body scanning process, there were real issues when I then went to the auto convert. It did very strange things to different parts of the body when the body shape was getting bigger and it didn't recognize what was happening with the body. Uh, when it came to the size 22, both the body scan and the measurements became unstable due, due to the infrared scanning of the body and how Clo recognized piece, the, the information that was obviously a little bit too big for what it was understanding it would be. Um, so again, th basically the findings for the project was um, well-fitting garments are going to uh, reduce waste. Customers want better fitting garments um, and brands could use scanned avatars to both increase, the, improve the way they're fitting, but also to um, address kind of, you know, communication with customers. If somebody can see an avatar that looks similar to them and then they can try the garment online on that avatar, it's hopefully going to reduce returns. Um, and now I'm just gonna pass over to Kyra, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about how we then presented the project. Um, so I worked with Kyra and we took this data and this information and we put it into a VR showroom. So Kyra, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you, Penny. Um, so, as Penny mentioned earlier, we had an innovation studio at Arts University Bournemouth um, and I spent some time working on the integration of new digital technologies into digital fashion workflows, um, but with a strong focus on virtual showrooms, so looking at VR and AR technologies and how this could be achieved. Uh, the innovation studio has a body scanner, but it also has VR uh, capabilities and a VR suite as well. Uh, so I wanted to create a smooth pipeline for creating virtual showroom environments to showcase virtual garments, but also visually demonstrate research like what Penny has created here. Um, so it's quite nice to see all the research put into a visual representation. Um, so uh, all the research that Penny had conducted um, has gone into this showroom environment and inside this virtual space. Uh, so after all the body scans were taken um, and processed through, uh, through CLO, sorry, um, we started to create the virtual environment. Uh, so you can see here some of the uh, production process of the environment. Um, so I started to 3D model some of the pieces uh, in 3D modeling software. So here we're using Cinema 4D, but you could be using any other things like Blender. There's plenty of options out there. Um, and once we created this environment, uh, the aim was to view the final outcome in VR. Uh, Penny's concept was to create a kind of virtual fitting room. So all of these little pods would represent or be for each of the models. Uh, so we created all these little pods, which would be the fitting rooms within the space, um, and then created additional assets, such as the little screens you'll see, um, and some of the other components. And some of those were actually created in CLO, so you can create 3D objects in CLO as well, as, as we know. Um, and then we started to take these virtual um, pieces, these 3D models, uh, into uh, other softwares. Um, so there's, again, plenty out there. You've got Unreal Engine, Unity, but here we went with um, Unreal and Twin Motion. Um, so we started to bring through all the pieces of the set into the Twin Motion space um, and begin the texturing process. Uh, this is where we started to notice a few of the problematic kind of components to the process. So a few issues with texturing along the way. And also if there's any ever little problems with your 3D modeling, they may be highlighted here when you start to do your texturing. So you might have to go back and make a few little tweaks along the way. 
Um, and once all the pieces are in here, you can see the showroom start to come together. Uh, so this was when the initial texturing was done, but just before we started to add uh, some of the final things like the avatars and the garments into the space. Uh, so now you'll see the populated uh, 3D environment. Um, so what's really nice with using Twinmotion um, and these other softwares is that we can create a space which can have renders um, taken out of the software. So you could use the images to showcase your work. Um, we can also do walkthrough videos. So we created a walkthrough video um, from the environment as well. Um, but it also can be viewed in VR. So it's quite an accessible way to showcase the research. Um, we had a pop up at the university, the little stand where Penny had her work on display um, with a VR headset. But also she's able to share this research and this environment with people uh, online or in presentations like this through the images that have been rendered, um, but also the walkthrough videos as well. So you'll just see a few images here. I think we've got a, a few slides of them of some of the final outcomes. Yeah, and then I think the next is the actual walkthrough of the showroom that you're talking about, which I hope everyone's going to be able to hear. This virtual reality experience is designed to highlight the possibilities and improvements that can be integrated into inclusive fashion design and production methodologies. Space you are now in is the prototype of a virtual avatar library that is being developed using the data collected from body scans of real women. These avatar libraries would be available to industry to utilise in the fit process from design through to sampling and production, allowing brands to make informed changes to garments and to fit different styles on different body shapes. Working virtually has many advantages. It's reactive, reduces waste and saves money. You can see from this that I do like a totem. I have one in the background here as well. <laughs> in this room, you will see seven avatar fit models wearing the same outfit. These avatars are developed from the body scans of seven size 12 participants. The jumpsuit they're all wearing has been provided by a UK high street brand. As you can see from looking around the space, the jumpsuit fits these women differently. This highlights the inadequacy of the current approach to size and fit adopted by industry. The space is created to be an engaging visual representation of the issues faced around fit and sizing. Issues that also impact severely on the sustainability and waste you will see on the wall in front of the avatars a large poster. This poster shows the jumpsuit on seven size 12 models in Clo 3D, fashion specific design software, where the fit maps are being used to highlight the fit. The colours represented on the fit of the garment, red highlights areas of tightness and blue shows a neutral effect on the fabric. This system can be used by a brand to see if there are any consistent fit issues on a range of different body shapes within a size bracket before a physical sample is produced. The outcome of this project can be experienced both through the immersive virtual reality experience and also by view viewing the video recorded of the virtual showroom. So yeah, the work Kyra did here is absolutely amazing on kind of bringing it to life. And I think that's kind of one of the lovely things um, about where we are at the Arts University Bournemouth. We have such great opportunity for collaboration, being sort of one campus with everybody under one roof. And we'll talk a little bit at the end just about sort of our what next stages. But um, we're currently currently getting very excited with some work with VFX at the moment as well that we have on campus. So um, yeah, just my opportunity again to thank both Christian and Kyra for their support in, in this project as well. And uh, I believe I'm now going to be passing over to Christian, who's going to talk to you um, briefly about 
body scanning and bespoke pattern making because obviously in, in that work we've talked about body scanning we've talked about patterns that already exist but what christian's been doing is actually using body scanning to create um parametric and data patterns so christian <laughs> over to you thank you yes um so as Penny mentioned um i have been working with the body scanner in a quite different or a quite similar way but uh, with different outcomes so um as well as working on the ma and ba course uh, for the last six years i also have been running uh, evening courses with my uh, friend jill um, we have done different types of evening courses, but one of them is um, clothes making. So we have um, anyone who can sign up for these kind of 10 week courses, evening courses uh, at AV. And as part of that, I get all these um, uh, people uh, into the body scanner. I scan them all. Um, and then if you, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just start by, um, getting their um, OBJ files, the object files of them, starting off similar to what uh, Penn has been doing by converting them all into uh, Clow avatars. Um, and I also take their measurements um, and then I have been uh, using the recipe of the uh, Winifred Aldridge uh, books. I have adapted it to kind of work with Clo, but I have, so my background comes from more um, kind of like physical pattern cutting, traditional pattern cutting. So I've been um, very um, trying to adapt the traditional into Clo. So starting from scratch uh, and, and creating the blocks from, um, from a sheet of paper uh, and then using the um, the, um, the recipe from the Winifred uh, Aldrich books to um, create the the blocks. Basically, uh, I've been working so throughout the three years that I've done this, I've almost uh, done made maybe uh, almost a hundred bespoke um, hip bodies blocks for uh, men, women, and um, and um, they dance everything to from um, size um, six up to size 28, 30. You have had a lot of different things. And, and of course, along the way, uh, there will be challenges, but I can um, promise you that if you want to get really good at uh, practicing your fit, you should try to uh, um, make um, hundred pairs of bespoke blocks for different um, people, because I'll tell you that um, they are all very different, but with the help of Clo, um, I would not be able um, to do that because with the uh, fitting purposes and the, um, the virtual fit um, elements, but also just kind of like how everything um, is, has become more um, speedy and once it's done you can print it out and the success rate so um after i have created these blocks uh, all the women got a paper copy and then they uh make them up and then obviously they they convert them into other garments eventually uh but they have these blocks forever that is based on their their uh, measurements and not their size so um it's just using implementing uh, the body scanner to kind of create uh, a body, um, a, a bespoke block based on their measurements, not their um, size and what size they uh, think they go within. What was quite funny though, is that a lot of the women uh, or men wanted to kind of like know what size they were in, but obviously the, the software wouldn't tell you what kind of size you would sit within. So, so it was quite easy question or answer to just say, you know what this is it's your size like it's uh, and i think it's definitely is um part of how um how things can be implemented for for the future as well um with the way the <clears throat> the blocks um are created based on their measurement uh and then yeah so it's you can see kind of the process that i've gone through with all these uh different 
uh, people that I have body scanned, testing in different fabrics and uh, trying trying different uh, strain maps and different fitting maps to to make it work and then uh, doing minor adjustments on Chloe before I um, print them out and give them to our um, yeah the participants in the evening courses. So yeah, this is kind of like the Amazing. end of uh, an example. But the, I think like the probably the biggest issue or the biggest problem is that like um, I've based a uh, based it on a, a recipe that is meant for like us around the size ten to twelve um, woman or or man. And obviously sometimes your body are just completely different. And I think that's kind of like has been a different uh, fit fit issue, but. Um, that's also where Clo has been um, most of use as well, because then I can try to do the virtual fit on on the um, before I print them out. Um, but yeah, great. Thank you, Christian. And yeah, all these lucky people that come along to your evening classes here at AUB as well and go away with their bespoke blocks. It's a it's a lovely bespoke service. Um, so yeah, I guess kind of the. From us, I guess maybe just some clo closing thoughts of Christian. I'll ask you first. You know, what do you think is next? I mean, that's part of kind of the the point of innovation and being at the university and sort of you know what what do you think is next? I think it's always I've always been a triple era and kind of combining the traditional physical way of doing things as well as digital. I would. Um, I would question the fact of anything being digital 100% always. It's I always think when I may produce my things digitally, I always kind of like keep in mind that this will be come and made physically as well one day. So making sure that the patterns work and using my pattern knowledge in in my 3D um, work has always been been good. I think uh, looking at what might be next, I think definitely. Um, introducing AI can can be um, beneficial to to the course and see how what the AI can can do um, not be scared of it uh, and but uh, implementing it in the correct way I think especially within um, working with um, algorithms within uh, sizing and and um, bespoke uh, blocks uh, I think that kind of will be definitely beneficial um, because it will give um, a viewer or uh, a lot more realistic um, outcome and hopefully less um, waste. But yeah, not sure if I answered that question, yes. but Kyra, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of new technology and, and things coming out, isn't it? But um, I think it's just next really is the way that we make it accessible to everyone. Um, you've got like the body scanner now, which is great. And we're starting to use that in ways. And you're starting to see these kind of screens appear where you can see a garment over the top of somebody. But if there's ways we can start to integrate maybe the body scans with a virtual garment that actually is simulated on the body, kind of getting that technology there so people in their shopping experience can see that rather than just an overlaid image of how it looks rather than how it fits. I think that's probably going to be some of the, the next steps. Yeah, I'd completely agree with you there. I think kind of augmented reality is is definitely something that the brands are sort of adopting. Um, and I think it's something that's going to be moving forward. And I think, again, Christian, yeah, as you said, I mean, AI has been, you know, AI has been around for ages. We can't be scared of it. We've all got Siri. We've got Alexa. You know, we've got auto convert. <laughs> um, but I think kind of honing and using AI, and I think it's really important that if, um, you know, if there's any other fellow colleagues, academics that are online, I think kind of, you know, making sure that our students can sort of, you know, be involved in it, have a conversation about it, think about how they can utilize it to support better practice in the industry, I think is, I think is really important. And I think we need to, we need to embrace it um, as practitioners to support the support our students who are going to be a million times better at us with it anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I think kind of the other thing, I mean, for me next as well, it's fabric digitization. I know the, the great updates come out with Clo, um, linking AI and kind of fabric digitization. And I think kind of really sort of focusing on 
fabric testing and fabric digitization is kind of something that I'm very much kind of looking forward to doing over the next sort of 12 months as well. So, yeah, thank you. I hope, I hope, I hope we were interesting. Uh, so adding to that, I think it would be really interesting to see uh, and it would be cool if Chloe could ever implement uh, virtual reality into the actual um, software and kind of like do real time virtual reality of the of the garments. That would be really, really cool to um, be really part of, of the fitting process and seeing it. Yeah, no, for scale. sure. I'm, I'm sure we have um, new things coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, uh, so well, it was fantastic. Thank you so much for the presentation. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, there was so many um, details about it and it was nice how you shared the process, um, the learnings, the challenges and all that. Um, I'm sure it's a, it's a presentation that we will have to watch again and see in detail again um, to, to, to get even more information. We have a lot of questions and and also compliments, many people loved it. They already wrote in the chat uh, saying that it was a great research um, and, and thank you for sharing um, everything with us. Uh, we have some questions. I'll, I'll start by the question. It's Lucia and Trudy, I think you have the same one. What kind of scanner did you use for the project, Penny? Um, size stream. So the, the scanner was a size stream scanner that works on, on infrared. So it takes lots of kind of, I mean, the same as kind of playing just dance in your living room with your, uh, <laughs> with your PlayStation. Um, so it, it was not one of the most advanced scanners. Um, we were looking at if we could kind of start rigging it up with some cameras with our VFX department as well to get kind of more realistic. Um, but it, yeah, size stream takes good, uh, body data it takes a number of scans as it scans the body and then kind of gives you the the averages for those so yeah yeah and i know that some people use phones to scan the body have you tested it would you recommend or not yeah so there's an app called me 360 um which i think can be really useful if um people are i was talking to um the founder of um the digital um just yesterday at the new coats in um london and i think kind of you know when you're creating bespoke garments if people are creating kind of digital fashion art but they want to turn it into a bespoke item i think the data that you're going to get from um me 360 or other kind of phone scanning that's fine i mean that's kind of where we're going we're, we're going to have you know the <laughs> we're going to be able to create a, a whole sort of bespoke library of clothing on our phones um and, and I think kind of, you know, we're just waiting for a time when we can all have our biometric data on a QR code and go online and be able to buy garments that fit with that. Um, but yeah, I think kind of using the Me360 app, using anything you can is, is great if you're experimenting with it and playing with it, definitely. Yes, great, yeah. And um, one question here from Jessica. Have you researched the shape not size concept through the lens of gentler's unisex clothing design? So it's something that we have looked at as well. Um, kind of, I mean, the lovely thing about genderless clothing, um, especially if you go back to like Izumiyaki body map, um, it's, you know, it is kind of that one size fits all concept, which is great as well. Um, and that's something that I absolutely love. And I think it's kind of really important that brands start to think, start thinking about more of a one size fits all. But for what I'm looking at with this, I almost have to categorize sizing to try and create some algorithms to help the industry with standardization of sizing. If we go to kind of one size fits all, then obviously we don't have the sizing issue, which is great but also we know that one size doesn't fit all so it's, it's a huge area as well to, to look at um and i know a lot of brands you know cos are really great where they look start looking at kind of more sort of streamlining their sizes um and it's you know it's been done in the past um it's still being done now but i don't think there's any sort of really i, I, I don't know christian do you have any thoughts on that i think it's um I think the the thing with this when you take away the sizing as well, you are left with with shape and measurements, and that's kind of like what 
genderless can be. It just depends what measurements your body can like. It's, 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 yeah, it speaks, yeah. and yeah. I guess that's kind of like where if you just take out the sizing and take out kind of like the menswear and the women's wear, and and you kind of like it's yeah, you're left with something that it doesn't matter what body you have. You just have you base it on the on the shape of your body. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that that's great. Yeah, and, and now I've been thinking about it when I saw the. Um, um the image of all the scanned bodies and how the jumpsuit fit each one differently this made me think of how will brands um, perceive this do you think they will think that they can solve the solution with on-demand production so people would insert their measurements and then the garment is created for them uh or do you think it's more in a sense of like virtual fitting? So before you purchase the garment, you can fit on your avatar and see um, how it looks. Um, in your point of view, which direction do you think it uh, brands will take? Um, well, I think quite a few brands are already kind of looking at showcasing um, garments on avatars, avatars that you can manipulate to your shape and size. You can go on. We, we all love the Attack website where you can go on and you can put in your, your height and your, your body measurements and then you can visually see how that's going to fit on you. Um, I think the industry feels that it's still a little faddy at the moment. Um, we, we all know we all work in the fashion industry. We take a long time to kind of change our ways and work in new ways. Um, I think kind of, you know, we're already, I mean, the, having bespoke biometric data for kind of garments that are tailored to your body is I mean that's really that's quite simple in a process it's you know go to the tailor and get measured well go to the body scanner and get measured you know it's it's not it's not dissimilar it's already happening so I think that is a very easy jump and I think that's something that will be moved to especially at the kind of higher end luxury brands well they're doing it already they're kind of using people's biometric data they're using body scanning and producing kind of garments that's been happening for a while. I think kind of having avatars on websites and customers using that way um, of communicating and seeing if a garment will fit, I'd like to see that happening. I think it's gonna be a little while longer before it is. I think we'll probably go through the uh, virtual try on and augmented reality before we kind of end up at that space, but it's a space I'd like to see us at. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. No, again, thank you so much. Uh, we learned a lot <laughs> with you all today. Uh, and for everyone, this will be on our YouTube, so you can check it again and see the presentation again. And if anyone wants to reach out to you, um, how they can contact you, Penny, Kyra, and Christian. Yeah, do you want us to put emails in the chat or? Yeah, that would be lovely, yes emails or LinkedIn, or what, what do you prefer? Dahlia is asking um, if we think it will be affordable to everyone to have um, his own avatar. What do you think, Penny? To have their own avatar. I, I mean, I actually, I, when I was at the conference um, yesterday and somebody mentioned something that, so my daughter who is 12, she already has loads of avatars of, of herself. Like she's got one in Animal Crossing. She's got one in Roblox. She creates outfits for them all the time. Um, and I think kind of with the sort of marriage between the gaming industry and the fashion industry, I, I see it as a real sort of a real reality. I, I agree a hundred percent. Yes, this will happen even more often. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining. Next week we'll be here again with the German International University talking about implementation from scratch. And on two weeks we will have Real Meets Digital with Hanover University talking about how they digitized. Um, the garment from a duke of the 16th century. So click here to register and it will be a pleasure to have you in the next upcoming weeks. And thank you again so much.
Fanny, Kyra, Christian, it was super inspiring and we learned a lot with you. Thank you Have for having us. Evening. Yeah, Fernanda, thank you for hosting us and thank you for letting us share a little bit about kind of what we're doing. We're, we're really passionate about digital fashion education um, and, you know, we, we, want, we want to share. We don't want to hide it away. We want to share and we want everybody doing it because it is going to make an impact um, and it's great fun. <laughs> no, 100%. And it's so easy to see that you're always um, sharing and uh, distributing the, the knowledge. So, yeah, it was a huge pleasure. Thank you so much. And so have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. See you next week. Hope you've enjoyed the session. Thank See you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.